Hi, I'm Mark Reed. Follow me as I attempt to put my new book, Impact Culture, into practice and discuss it with others taking a similar journey. You'll get tips that will help you achieve more impact from your research and stay healthy, no matter how busy you are. Rediscover your purpose. Lead from behind to empower those around you. Transform your work culture. Welcome to Season 4 of the Fast Track Impact Podcast. Okay, so we're coming towards the end of the theme that I've been talking about on the podcast over the last few months now on evidencing impact. Uh, I started off with uh, a few definitions, approaches, tools uh, around uh, both monitoring and evaluating and how we can then use that monitoring and evaluation data to... um, uh, to, uh, to 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 create evidence uh, that can convince an audience uh, that uh, you did indeed have impact. Uh, we've had a few interviews. It's been great. We uh, talked to Rachel Blanche uh, from uh, Queen Mar- Margaret University in Edinburgh uh, about arts-based techniques, uh, which was fun. Um, we looked at some uh, some example methods. So I gave you my postcard to your future self uh, in as a way in to get GDPR um, uh, compliant um, permission to follow up with people, to do surveys, uh, interviews uh, and the like. Um, we looked at uh, different kinds of of, of, of of software to monitor this kind of stuff. So we looked at Grow Impact, OutNav, and Impact Tracker. Uh, we had a conversation with Eric Jensen as well uh, about uh, survey design in particular, but a whole load of other tools and methods that you can use to do a really high quality evaluation. And last week, of course, it was uh, Michael Parker from the conversation um, and uh, the the Media Impact Guide and Toolkit. So this week, I want to apply all of this stuff to the research excellence framework. So apologies to those of you who are not in the UK, although I do sometimes find that that people are interested for some reason (laughs) from outside the UK. Uh, So do feel free to to, to skip to the the next episode, whatever that's going to be, if uh, if that's uh, not of interest to you. And uh, I'll be doing this uh, somewhat uh, off the uh, cuff in terms of the the, the, the evolving evidence um, uh, about what is going to be required um, for our next draft in 2028. Uh, but also uh, I'll be drawing on some of my training slides that I use uh, to uh, help people prepare for REF 2028. So that's uh, that's the plan. Um, and to, to start off just uh, with, a, I guess, a, a critical introduction to all of this stuff, I think it's worth pointing out that the majority, so there's a, a Research England survey, it's 57% of researchers in the UK have negative attitudes towards the ref. It's only a slim majority, so we're, we're not uh, all hanging our heads in despair. There are benefits from this, and of course... Uh, REF uh, has driven a huge amount of investment in impact um, uh, uh, armies of impact officers, other professional services staff with expertise that has been honed over these years uh, that enables us to support and achieve impacts we probably would never, never otherwise be achieving. But uh, there is a dark side to this. Uh, we've talked previously with uh, Gemma Derrick on the podcast, in fact, uh, about Grim Pact. Uh, and do check out uh, what she's doing at the moment. She's got a call for Grim Pact. Um, I put it out on X and uh, my last uh, newsletter. Um, but uh, but yeah, check out what she's doing in that space. Um, it'd be great to support that work. Uh, another survey, this was the Wellcome Trusts. Uh, 4,000 researchers, if I remember rightly, in the UK. Uh, back in 2020, uh, it said uh, 75% of these researchers said that they felt their creativity was being stifled due to research being driven by an impact agenda. Uh, my own research with uh, Jennifer Chubb from University of York, uh, led by Jen, um, uh, based on interviews that she did with Australian and uh, UK researchers, uh, suggests one of the reasons for this being that people no longer believe they can ask the most original and academically significant research questions if they are not impactful enough to be fundable. Uh, and um, uh, and the result of this is that uh, there's a huge amount of pressure 
uh, on researchers who feel increasingly performance managed, metricized, um, uh, yeah, and uh, and we're putting in funding bids, making decisions based on those numbers, based on uh, where the money is, uh, where the incentives are, etc. And uh, and this was, of course, the reason that I wrote my book, Impact Culture, uh, the idea that. Uh, ultimately, when you look at most impact cultures in the in the UK, they are shaped by funding mandates and REF, um, and these can be incredibly demotivational. Uh, and a, a plea to take charge of this uh, ourselves and build the kind of high integrity, uh, ethical. Uh, solutions focused research that can drive impact with communities of academic researchers and non academics uh, that want to see the change that we want to see, uh, that share a sense of purpose uh, with us, that gives us a sense of, of meaning uh, in our work. And of course, the capacity that we need to do that kind of research, build those kind of communities, and pursue that kind of single minded purpose, whatever that purpose might be. So that's my attempt to um, to give you a, a critical introduction to REF. Yeah, we've got this thing. It's good and it's not so good. Um, uh, so REF 2028, what do we know at the moment? Well, having a look at the initial decisions document uh, published uh, fairly recently, early this year, uh, by Research England, uh, based on their consultation and the work that they've done, suggests four main changes to impact. So the first is a reduction in the number of impact case studies needed for a submission. And uh, that's a, a good thing if you are in a fairly small unit. So there are a number of units that did not submit last time because uh, they, uh, yeah, they they needed two impact case studies as a minimum. And, um, and if you didn't have that, you didn't have a viable submission. So this means that you could put in a very small submission with just one impact case study. And that makes this more inclusive. So for me, this is uh, very much a progressive um, new change. Uh, linked to this also um, is, uh, again, another progressive change, which is the removal of the two-star threshold for underpinning research. So previously, we had to demonstrate that uh, the underpinning research as a body of work uh, was collectively at a two-star level. Uh, and that is internationally significant, um, both in terms of its rigour, uh, but also its originality and academic significance. Uh, and the problem here was that a lot of impacts don't require academic originality and significance of that level. Yes, it needs to be original because it needs to be research, um, but, um, but yeah, it doesn't have to be internationally uh, original and significant. For example, yeah, we are taking a model, a method, a framework, um, a bit of kit, whatever it might be, and we are applying it in a new domain, uh, in a in a new sector. For example, uh, the, the the thing itself is is not new. Maybe there's a few adaptations that are uh, are, are novel and interesting, uh, but this is not internationally significant. And yet, now we've moved into this new sector. This is yeah, doing so much more good, saving lives, uh, money, whatever it might be. Um, and uh, and Lord Stern recommended this uh, for the previous ref. It wasn't taken up, so that recommendation is now being taken up. Taken up, um, uh, but it still does need to be underpinning research. So uh, I expect, and we don't know, we don't have confirmation of this yet, but I expect that in the more detailed guidance that we are expecting, that we will uh, see some kind of guidance uh, around the narrative that we have to write that explains why this is research. Uh, so for me, I'm going to define research simply as original new knowledge. So what is original about this? It doesn't have to be internationally uh, blindingly original, but um, but it has to be that sense of, yeah, there is new knowledge here. This is not just the application of existing knowledge, so which would be how I would define consultancy. Um, and, and, and something around rigour as well. So it's new knowledge that has been uh, developed um, through rigorous uh, methods, approaches, etc. Uh, because uh, clearly, uh, if we've done some really dodgy research uh, that is actually really not very rigorous, and um, and and these are findings that are ultimately wrong in some way or misleading, and now we're building impact on that. That's also not uh, not great. <laughs> so uh, I expect to, to to have to demonstrate this in some way. I expect through that narrative. Yeah, there could be some other methods, um, but uh, but as long as this is research, then uh, great. Uh, job done. 
The um, the, the next two, uh, final two points uh, are around the reintroduction of an impact and, and engagement narrative, uh, and uh, and what we need to do about engagement now. So in REF 2014, there was an impact narrative where we had to write about our strategy and support and kind of capacity building stuff uh, around impact, uh, etc. And uh, we could talk about wider impacts and uh, and work that we're doing beyond our impact case studies. Um, and uh, we don't have detailed guidance on this, but I'd expect something similar in relation to uh, to impact. Uh, but uh, at the same time, um, I, I think we are also going to, um, well, it, it, we, we are being told we have to write about engagement as well. So this is an engagement and impact narrative. Um, and so uh, before I move on to what I think we might want to include in that, um, uh, let's just make this very clear. Uh, we have an engagement and impact narrative, and that is where we are being told that we need to write about engagement, not <coughs> our impact case studies. Now, <coughs> that impact narrative is going to be um, uh, worth um, uh, up to, uh, well, for most of us, it's going to be worth 5%. Um, so of that 25% impact, 5% of that is going to be the impact narrative and um, uh, and 20% and is going to, going to then be spread across our impact case studies. There's going to be a sliding scale. Uh, we'll see the details of this uh, later on, but the suggestion is that um, if you are in that small unit and you're only submitting one impact case study, uh, then um, then this is going to be split 50-50 between the case study and your impact narrative, so 12.5% each. Uh, so, um, so, so we have to write about impact uh, and engagement in this uh, in this narrative, and uh, the, the impact case studies remain the same. They are about impact. Um, as far as we can see, there is no change to the criteria. There are three, although we tend to only write about the two of those, which is um, the uh, the reach and significance of the impact, but implicitly and very clearly, and its attribution back to your research. Uh, so uh, those are the criteria. They've not changed. We didn't see any major change in the format length last time. We don't expect to see any major change to that uh, either this time. And we know, um, quoting Rachard et al., uh, Bella Rachard's uh, paper uh, with me and colleagues, looking at the 2014 data, that the number one predictor of low scores is people who wrote about their engagement, dissemination, the technology, the process, the pathway instead of the impact. And so uh, I'll come on to that uh, in a moment in terms of uh, why we might want to write about engagement a little bit, um, but it only is uh, is done where it is necessary to demonstrate attribution. Otherwise, we focus on what we're being graded on, which is impact in the case studies. So when it comes to, uh, to, the, uh, to the engagement part of the uh, of the engagement and impact narrative what are what are we looking for in in, in this um, and so this is my fourth point now which is uh, in this document the research england talked about the rigor of engagement and uh, there's been a lot of head scratching on that uh, i got to ask them directly in a webinar that i ran and recorded and i'll give you a link to the blog uh, where you can see the full hour if you want all the detail uh, or just read the highlights um, from uh, from the blog and they explained that actually what they meant by that was good practice engagement. So I'll give you a link to this. They've cited uh, the National Coordinating Centre on Public Engagement and their guidance, which is great. So have a look at that. Uh, I'll also give you a link to my um, uh, my Rethinking Impact paper with Hannah Rodman that, uh, that uh, picks up on some similar themes, but I think takes this deeper in terms of uh, an equality, diversity and inclusion approach to engagement and impact um, that starts to think about the ethics of how and why we engage. So I'd encourage you to have a look at both of those as sources uh, to kind of have a think about, well, what does good practice engagement look like? Um, and then, yeah, how do we write about that? Well, clearly we need to understand what good practice is and then apply that, and we will need evidence that we have applied that good practice. And so that could be uh, around processes. And um, and one thing that, that I've been thinking about, and I'm going to be um, doing an episode on this in the new year, I've got this scheduled in uh, back with Eric Jensen, who's a, a, a specialist on uh, ethics, among other things, um, 
Uh, and uh, my, my thinking will hopefully have evolved by then and will be further evolved by Eric in that conversation. Um, I've got a project, in fact, at the moment with the University of Plymouth where we're exploring this. Um, so, uh, so lots of, uh, of room uh, to, to, to expand thinking on this. And I'd love to hear from you. Uh, but uh, yeah, ethics of engagement, ethics of impact. Uh, what are the processes you need around that? We have ethics committees in our universities, but they are research ethics if we are interacting with other people. Um, uh, and so this is typically the social sciences. Others do have to do this sometimes. But if you're doing research and it involves uh, talking to people, interacting with people, engaging with them in some way, uh, then you have to go through ethics. And yet we talk to people, we engage with people, often on very controversial issues uh, when it comes to impact. But because it's not research, we don't have to put this through an ethics committee. Unless, and let's just think about this, uh, you are planning to collect uh, data from your engagement and potentially publish that in part of a peer-reviewed journal or as an epilogue to your monograph or something like that. Huh. All of a sudden, that evaluation is being published effectively as research. Is it actually research data? And so uh, the, the sense that, that, that I have is uh, that uh, if we are going to be collecting data that you might you just want to keep the door open, you might want to ultimately publish that somewhere, then we should actually be putting uh, our impact plans, uh, all of that engagement stuff through a, an ethics committee. Um, uh, so, uh, so I think uh, our ethics committees need to broaden their scope to research and impact, um, uh, and they need to be looking at those impact plans uh, alongside the, the research plans at the beginning of research and providing feedback on that. Those ethics committees then clearly need guidance on, to, on how to do that, uh, the kind of feedback that they might be giving to make that engagement more responsible, uh, more effective, uh, uh, better practice uh, effectively. Uh, and I think there's a, a paucity of guidance there. Um, uh, and so that, uh, that's something that you might want to think about, uh, might want to talk to your ethics committee. Yeah, what are we doing? Uh, and I think it's, it is a question that ethics committees really should be asking themselves because, um, uh, yeah, what happens if something goes catastrophically wrong? Uh, we have a researcher in our department that is doing something really high risk um, and um, and it leads to negative negative unintended consequences. Um, so I think I talked to you about uh, a, a gentleman who will remain nameless who um, had done some really dodgy research, a, a sample size of one, uh, and based on the, these interactions with one person, he'd drawn a bunch of conclusions, had built a therapeutic program, was treating people uh, based on this. Um, and the criticism so the criticism was this is a this treatment is an abuse against human rights. Um, this is a barbaric treatment that should not be allowed. And it's is causing more harm than good um and um and and yeah something like that comes out um and um and yeah he didn't do any research that was kind of the whole problem so this never went through a research ethics committee um but uh, but he was doing a whole load of stuff in practice uh, trying to heal people and potentially causing more problems than he was good convinced that what he was doing was 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 great but without any evidence and um, and yeah, there was no oversight. Uh, and ultimately, if that goes badly wrong, um, then you've got people suing the university. And uh, and and yeah, well, where are the safeguards? Uh, what are the processes? Uh, what, what do we do to to make sure that this stuff doesn't go that badly wrong? Um, and I don't think many of us have answers to that. Uh, but we should certainly be asking uh, asking those uh, those questions. Um, is this a, a sledgehammer to crack a nut? Yeah, maybe. And um, and so this is why this has not really worked out in my own head yet. I think when we're starting a project, yeah, let's do that. But um, things change. And when you look at how engagement evolves over a three-year project, you have to adapt. And you have to adapt strongly. And very often what you end up doing is completely different to what you planned. And that is good practice as well. You know, we don't just doggedly stick to a plan that we can see is not going to work anymore. Um, and uh, every time we switch, uh, should we then take that back to our ethics committee? Uh, and um, and certainly with my own practice, I'm doing a lot of policy engagement. I'm engaging with yeah, sometimes 10 or more different policy colleagues in a single week. Um, and we're just having really fluid conversations in a very fluid policy environment and adapting week in, week out. 
even if you think yes surely you should take that back actually how realistic if is this um if this is changing at that frequency um uh, and uh, and yeah how do you predict and and plan all the people that you end up talking to and and, and how you talk to them and what yeah so are we going to tie ourselves up in knots um and there, there seems to be for me some kind of midway here where we are expanding the remit of uh, of uh, of ethics committees so this is impact and research ethics um, we're giving people training we've got guidelines we've got processes uh, we can get that constructive feedback um, we've got at least some safeguards for major changes uh, especially in projects that have been tagged as potentially high risk yeah maybe we do uh, enforce that and make sure people come back um but at the same time, I think there's a lot to be done just in the training space. Um, so we need guidance, guidelines, toolkits, uh, that kind of stuff. But uh, but we also need to, to, to think about how we then get people to engage with that. Uh, so that could be the kind of training that people like I do. Maybe that's something that is important enough that we build that into induction processes for all new researchers, uh, perhaps, as well. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, but uh, but uh, yeah, there needs to be there needs to be a lot more knowledge, capacity, uh, and thought. I think um, put put into this. So, um, first thing that uh, that we're going to think about is yeah, as I said, evidence of processes that ensure that we have good practice in place for our engagement as well as our impact. Um, I, I think. Um, the other thing that we might want to include in this is uh, our one and two star impacts, our less mature impacts that are worthy, that are important. Let's celebrate that. Let's share the diversity of things that we're doing. So that might include, for example, a lot of, a lot of the public engagement that we're doing um, uh, that perhaps is leading to changes in, in understanding or attitudes uh, that in a very applied discipline uh, might not be. Uh, that competitive uh, but actually yeah that's important let's, let's talk about some of those things as well and uh, again this makes it more inclusive which i think is great uh, we get a, a much great broader cross-section uh, of uh, of impacts uh, and activities um, so so let's think about that um and um and yeah, other good practice around engagement and impact uh, that, uh, that that otherwise we wouldn't be able to talk about, or shout about. So great, we've got an engagement and impact strategy. Um, uh, here's the training that we're doing um, uh, and, and other capacity building things. Here's what we're doing in terms of our leadership um, and our leadership programs. Here's how we're building communities. Here's uh, our coaching program and how we upgraded our mentoring program to a coaching program and created a, a specific uh, impact coaching uh, element. Um, this is our impact mentoring program for people who are wanting to work in policy, for example, working with others who have experience. Um, yeah, all of those kinds of things. Um, uh, and uh, do have a look in my Impact Culture Toolkit. So um, if you just go for fasttrackimpact.com forward slash impact culture, you will, uh, you'll get, uh, you'll get um, a whole load of ideas that you might want to uh, explore in that space and do. So four things that we know are coming down the line to us in ref 2028 my thoughts on uh, on what we might need to do in those spaces of course we'll get more clarification but hopefully at least some of those thoughts are useful um I, that's, uh, I'm just going to kind of look through some of the stuff I do in training um, before then just coming back to REF and giving you a bit more strategic guidance um, uh, based on Bella's paper and some ongoing research that Bella and uh, I, I'm, I am doing with Saskia Ghent and Jed Hall. Um, and so um, coming back to REF in a moment, um, but uh, one of the questions that I get from people at this point in the REF cycle is, well, great, I've got these plans, here's what I'm doing, but I'm not sure it's significant enough. Or I've got something that's quite significant, but it's just tiny in reach. Um, yeah, it's just our pilot, um, uh, our research sample, perhaps even. And um, I want to, to take you back, I'll put a link to, the, to these in the show notes, um, to the impact planning template and my 3i analysis template. Uh, more um, once we get that paper published, uh, it's uh, under review at the moment, more on 3i's in a future episode uh, to coincide with that publication. But we have the, the templates, we've got worked examples, that's uh, online. Uh, they're Google Sheets, so you can just um, copy them and then adapt them for your own purpose. 
But when you're looking for more significance, then my uh, well, let's, let's start with reach. Actually, uh, looking for more reach. Great, got a good idea. It's working really powerfully. I need to now do that three eye analysis, which is to try and work out who has an interest. First eye of those interested people, who has influence. The second eye, and then finally, uh, who is directly going to be impacted, either positively or negatively, by this. The third eye, influence, interest, impact. And uh, from that, uh, I get a whole load of different organizations and I can grade them. I can go for the high interest, high impact, high influence organizations. Great. Let's reach out to some of those. They might now be able to take us to all of their national members, um, to their international networks, customers, whatever it might be. Uh, But we also can use this to be more... um, Uh, more inclusive, as I've said uh, in previous episodes. Uh, So the people who are not that interested, they have no influence, uh, but uh, they could be highly impacted and we make sure that we, we work with them. And if I'm struggling, I do this in a workshop setting with a few people who are more engaged than I am and instantly, great, I've got some ideas about where I go to take this into the big time. Um, uh, second issue then is great. I think I've got uh, the, the 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 reach of working with the biggest organisation of its kind in the world, but it's just not significant enough. It's not making a big enough in a difference for this to be something worth shouting about. Um, uh, and so uh, the question now is uh, working with that organisation, but perhaps also with some of those others that you've identified through a three I analysis. You're asking that that question, what would make a really difference? If there were no resource constraints, if we could do anything that we wanted, how would we build on this? How would we turn this into something that would be a game changer? Um, and a lot of those ideas will be pie in the sky, but some of them might just work. And now we've got a bunch of infused people with us, uh, with access to perhaps resources, um, things that we don't have access to that say, well, yeah, actually, this is possible. And here's why. Let's make this happen. So um, I guess the first thing to to, to say uh, in terms of building up to your ref and pack case study is make sure that you have got significance and reach and use those tools to try and get there. Second thing to say, I guess, is just to remind you back to that first episode I did in uh, in this theme. Let's uh, monitor, let's track as we go, find a way of doing that quickly, easily yourself, whether or not you as an institution are subscribed to one of the three uh, examples that we looked at uh, a couple of episodes ago in terms of uh, software or some other bit of software. Pure is quite a common example uh, in the UK, for example. Um, uh, make sure you've got some kind of system yourself um, uh, and yeah, engage with the system if you have one uh, and if you like it and you find it useful, easy uh, to use. Uh, and if you're told you have to engage with it and you don't want to, great, engage when you have to, but you will now have a whole load of stuff sitting there at your fingertips. It'll be quicker, easier. You'll do a better job. Uh, We are designing evaluations. Uh, You've got lots of ideas from the last few episodes on how you can do that in terms of uh, the overall evaluation design, but also some of the methods that you might want to use. We did a deep dive with Eric, remember, on testimonials um, uh, and with Rachel on arts-based methods, etc. But uh, but now we're we're coming to um, uh, to the... um, yeah, back to back to Ref and to what we're going to do now to turn all of this monitoring and evaluation data into evidence. And evidence uh, simply uh, being, uh, uh, if I define this as how you use your monitoring and evaluation data to communicate provable claims. So we're, uh, evidence is, is the claim uh, that uh, it is communicated and believed by proven to a particular audience and so you'll have different audiences um, and so evidence for one audience might look different to another audience so so audiences demand higher degrees of rigor for example Um, different foci for example so uh, in my own impact case study I uh, created the impact case study for my institution and for REF Uh, But I also then created another version of that, just looking at one subset of that evidence, which was the charity that I've been working with uh, and the first 10 years of its operation. uh, And I turned that into a paper, fairly low grade paper, uh, probably no more than two star. 
uh, uh, but uh, but this is now uh, still high quality evidence, but it's just one subset of that focusing on the impacts uh, that I was able to develop with that organization and its other impacts, not just the ones that I was involved in. Uh, and that was giving something back to that organization. Um, but two very different uh, forms of evidence communicated to different audiences for different purposes. And their purpose was to share with their funders um, uh, to justify further funding for, for the charity. Now, I've spoken about this in previous episodes in the last season, so I'm not going to go into this in any depth. I'll give you a link to the paper with Bella and colleagues, uh, Reichard et al. What was this? 2015? No, it wasn't. It was 2020. I'm miles out. <laughs> um, and uh, and I want to just very briefly summarise the key findings from this, the so three key findings, and then just have a think about how we might implement this um, in uh, in an impact case study. So uh, the first finding from this paper, uh, which is from the 2014 database, um, but uh, as I've explained, 2021 impact case studies effectively remain the same. We're expecting them to remain the same effectively in 2028. So uh, my argument is this data holds, this is still relevant. Uh, and the first finding uh, was that uh, if you did what you were asked and you presented evidence of high magnitude, so high scoring uh, claims of significance and reach, then you did well. Um, but they're high magnitude, but they're also specific. So uh, uh, high uh, graded impact case studies uh, would be talking, and this is uh, from the linguistic analysis about in England, the US, the UK. So we've got jurisdictional reach, it's specific and it's national, so big, specific, compared to a number of, a range of, and nationally and internationally, but I'm kind of waving my hands around, not going to be quite so specific uh, on this. Um, and uh, local, the North, uh, a city council, uh, for example, compared to the government, the House of Commons, a select committee, prime minister, etc. Uh, so there's a specificity and a magnitude to the claims in the high scoring ones, which you don't see in the low scoring ones. And intriguingly, the low scoring ones also talk about impact. They use the word impact a lot. Honestly, this is impact. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the biggest uh, finding here is um, that if you didn't actually uh, give evidence of the impact, and in fact you're mainly writing about dissemination, engagement, the technology, but not how it was used and what the benefit was, then you missed the point and you didn't do well. Now, uh, in interestingly, uh, yeah, there are three criteria, significance, reach, and attribution. And uh, uh, attribution, if you didn't get that right, worst case scenario, uh, this is not your impact, you'd get unclassifiable. But if there are just weaknesses, uh, leaps of logic, uh, weak uh, arguments, uh, then panels could downgrade you for problems with your attribution. And so we need to demonstrate attribution. Um, and in the high scoring ones, we have all this attributional language. So cited in the, was used to inform, to improve the, led to the, resulting in, um, produced by, uh, uh, cited in, led by, uh, these kind of phrases. And on the right hand side of these phrases um, is it led to an impact. <laughs> Uh, and you do see some low, um, uh, so, so some attributional phrases in the low-scoring uh, case studies, not many. And when you analyse that, it turns out that they are attributing to more research uh, or to pathway, but rarely to impact. So we need to keep our eye on the bull. We uh, provide these golden chains from our research to our impact. The third and final of these findings from our paper was that uh, language does matter. Uh, this is, uh, I've presented, presented these three uh, in order of importance. So if you don't have any evidence, if you don't have a, a, a significant and far-reaching claim you can attribute to your research, you're not going to do well. Uh, but you can potentially just write this well enough to get that score. And the difference between three and four star may well be uh, your use of language. So the high scoring ones with more direct, plain language, fewer expressions of uncertainty, hedging statements, the stuff of good academic practice, which we're not seeing here, because this is a different purpose here, not to uh, explain all of the uncertainties, but to try and point out the things that we can say with certainty. Uh, uh, we're not using vague uh, or, or unsubstantiated adjectives like it was transformational, but I'm not going to tell you quite why or how or what that transformation was. 
um, uh, and we kind of linearized and simplified that messy reality uh, to create a narrative that communicates uh, what we can evidence was impact. Uh, they are written uh, in a way that is easier to understand, but this is not about dumbing it down uh, so that, say, a 12-year-old reader could understand this. These are uh, groups of experts um, who understand your discipline uh, and your context. So they are technical documents, um, but uh, a flesh reading e-score suggests that the high scoring ones were um, uh, easier to read. And, um, and they were more likely to make use of subheadings. Um, so, for example, uh, in section four, having subheadings that point to impact one, impact two, <laughs> here you are, you can't miss where the impacts are. And intri intriguingly, uh, panel D, which is uh, arts and humanities, where you might be least likely to uh, expect lots of subheadings, uh, was the, the place where you were most likely to see lots of subheadings. Uh, the effect size was greatest um, uh, on that point. Um, so a group of people who realised, yeah, we have to write differently if we want to, to uh, if we want to, to to actually get credit for what we're doing. And so finally, then um, to uh, to the, the the anatomy of a claim and how you put this into practice. Um, so let's um let's have a look so first of all narrative structure so it's worth asking yourself um, if you've got lots and lots of different claims uh, do you want to build them together into some composite claims so in my own case study i had two composite claims um i don't know over a dozen in total uh, but uh, but we're going to group them in my case national and international policy impacts uh, whatever thematic or other uh, grouping you might want uh, see what works and in my case, then, what I'm doing is uh, I'm weeding out the one and two star impacts and deleting where possible. I keep the three and four star impacts and I start a narrative that starts at three star, concludes in four star. And uh, overall, uh, the, the, the idea is that, uh, that this is graded as overall. This is a four star claim. Uh, now, what do I do with those one and two star impacts? Uh, if I can, as I said, I just delete them. In some cases, I can't do that without creating uh, an attributional problem. Uh, so if I need those early impacts, and this also applies to engagement, to demonstrate those impacts are actually mine, they do link back to the research, I have to keep them in. But I will do that in a little introduction at the beginning of that details of the impact section. It could be even labelled as pathway to impact. And what I'm saying to the, the reader is this is just pathway, it's not impact. And you can see there's a subheading coming up that says impact one, that's where the impact starts, therefore start grading me there. Uh, you need to know this stuff uh, for context uh, and attributional purposes, but don't grade me for it as impact because it's not impact, therefore don't grade me down on it. So uh, the first element is, uh, is, a, is a narrative structure. The second then is causal structure. So uh, as I move from three to four star within that aggregate claim, um, I'm saying one thing leads to the next, leads to the next. And, and the pattern is always research to impact. I keep reminding people there's research underpinning this and this is the impact. And in some cases, it's research to, uh, to engagement to impact if I need that for attributional purposes or research to three star impact, three star impact to four star impact. Um, but keeping reminding people that there is that research, that golden thread and uh, keeping uh, the, uh, the, uh, the focus on the impacts. And then finally, to conclude, we need a claim structure. And so we're going to, to write a claim uh, that uh, ideally benchmarks the reader at, oh, that's impressive, that sounds like four star. Uh, and there's an impact, sorry, there is a, a reach and a significance component to it. So we've got, uh, oh, four star significance, sounds impressive, looks like four star reach. Uh, and uh, and then you back up that claim with the evidence in the rest of that paragraph, and uh, that uh, and so you provide the evidence for reach, the evidence for significance, and you remind the reader of the attribution back to your research. Uh, if you want an example, uh, you can have a look at my uh, my own impact case study. So if you just uh, Google, uh, well, Google it or go into the REF uh, 2021 database, it's called Restoring Global Peatlands for Climate Benefits. And you can see exactly how I did that um, that construction. But uh, yeah, at this point, my hope is that you've got a much clearer sense of what to expect in REF 2028. Um, uh, with, uh, with a bit of critical thinking around that, um, uh, some caveats, uh, some questions, I fear perhaps more questions than answers at this point because of where we are in the, uh, in, in the process. 
but uh, certainly food for thought, especially around uh, around engagement. Um, uh, yeah, something I didn't mention actually just occurred to me is uh, is how we how we monitor and track our engagement. Do we need evidence of that as well? Um, and how do you do that in a proportionate way if you're engaging every day? Um, a problem for some people, not for others, I guess, <laughs> depending on how much engagement you're doing. But so many questions around how to get our head around that, very specifically for that engagement and impact uh, narrative, not so much for the impact case studies. And um, apologies if you've heard what I've done with Bella, my interviews with her uh, in the past. Um, uh, I guess more of a recap, um, but uh, just a signpost in the at the end of our last season of the of the podcast, way way more detail and depth on that um, and the kind of advice we were giving to people towards the end of the last ref period um, with Bella. Go go back and listen to those episodes if you want much more on this. Um, but uh, but hopefully a sense of of how to use that evidence to structure claims that will get you um, get you credit for the work that you're doing in this space. So I think that's me done on uh, uh, on on, uh, on evidence uh, for impact on evaluating impact. Uh, we'll see. I'm not quite sure where we're going to go after this, but hopefully this has been useful. As I said, we will follow this off with another session. Uh, on uh, the ethics of impact um, in the new year ethics of engagement and impact so uh, yeah we will we will revisit and do get in touch if you have thoughts reflections ideas of your own and i'll work that into that thinking Uh, maybe you even want to come and join us uh, on the podcast to talk about it if you've got some ideas so enjoy and good luck with whatever you are doing to evaluate monitor ultimately to evidence your impact